My name is Sean Delaney. I'm with the Alberta Transplant Institute, and welcome to our seminar series today. Um, we'll start with uh, our land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community to this day. Thank you to Paladin for their support of this API seminar series. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Amy Sarvi uh, joining us today as our speaker. Dr. Sarvi is an intensivist with the Department of Critical Care at the Ottawa Hospital and an associate professor with the University of Ottawa. She's completed training in internal medicine, palliative care, and critical care. She's also completed a fellowship with the Department of Innovation in Medical Education, and her master's is in Health Professionals Education at the University of Dundee, Scotland. Dr. Sarthi's program of research is focused on the delivery and evaluation of system-level educational interventions to improve the care of critically ill patients. She currently is co-leading the development of a national organ donation education program for critical care fellows. To inform this program, Dr. Sarthi has led a qualitative national investigation of substitute decision makers' perceptions and experiences surrounding organ donation in Canadian ICUs. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarthi. Um, for a seminar entitled The Share Study, Canadian Family Members Sharing Their Experiences with Critical Care and Organ Donation. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Sean, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here today. I'm really excited to share some of the results and um, and, and to get some feedback from the group as well. So I guess first I'm going to... All right. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, results from our family members sharing their experiences around organ donation and critical care, and we'll just get right into it. So first of all, some acknowledgements, certainly at uh, the forefront are sincere to all of the family members who have time to participate in these interviews and really share their experiences with us so that we could learn and grow. Um, this work would not have been possible without uh, the support of Canadian Blood Services and each of the organ donation organizations listed here. And certainly there was a significant contribution from the, the group in Alberta. We'll be going through the background of uh, leading up to the study, uh, the share study goals and methods. I'm going to specifically focus uh, much of the time on our recent publication with recommendations from family members and also uh, highlight the national education program and some thoughts around future directions. When we look at the literature and we look at Canadian data on what we know about family members' experiences in uh, Canadian ICUs, really the data has been quite limited leading up to the work of our, our, our national group and collaboration in understanding what they go through. And when we look internationally as well, much of the work is really focused on the donation decision. And we really wanted to look more comprehensively at the complete experience to see where we could enhance the family-centered care. It led us to our first study, uh, which was published in Progress and Transplantation, and this was a, a multi-center qualitative investigation of family members um, in Ontario, and, um, and really learned from this process a lot of really important messages, and uh, in this pilot work, we took that to inform the national study. The goal of this national work was to perform a qualitative investigation to comprehensively explore that complete experience of those who consented and those who declined in Canadian ICUs. And recognizing that this is important for so many different reasons and, um, and certainly to work to improve family satisfaction and the family-centered care that we're providing in the intensive care units, our hope to be able to improve post-ICU family outcomes, our end of life care practices, potentially consent rates, and certainly a big driver of this with developing a, a, a program for critical care fellows training to improve our skills in this domain. 
The study design was qualitative with telephone interviews. We had um, an interview guide that was developed by a multidisciplinary team that included open-ended and semi-structured inquiry. And we really designed it to go through the complete experience. So including learning the, the moments that they learned that their loved one was critically ill, to learning that they were not going to survive or that there was a neurologic determination of death performed. Um, and then the moments that followed that and organ donation decision making and that process all the way to being out of the hospital and um, their, their, their bereavement period. All of the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed. We had five researchers who uh, coded the data and utilized Atlas software for this. Here on this slide, just to show our recruitment process, um, certainly we had a lot of uh, incredibly important engagement with the organ donation organizations for this, and family members were included if they had been approached regarding an organ donation decision in Canada. It had to be at least two months after the patient's death in the ICU and up to three years. Family members were only excluded if they could not understand or interpret the interview questions because of uh, language or cognitive barriers, or if we had no current contact information. And we did interview in both English and French. And on the um, other side here, on the flow side, you can see the process. It was a really carefully structured um, outreach to family members. Uh, all eligible family members were compiled from each of the ODO databases. They were sent a letter to discuss the, the, the details around the interview process. Following that, a coordinator reached out to see if they were interested and if they were agreeable to um, discussing further with the research team. And for those who were, then we received their information and um, invited them to complete an interview. Put up this here um, uh, to show kind of the number of family members uh, that were originally in the database. And these are very challenging types of studies to do with outreach through phone calls and letters. Um, and you can see here up at the top that uh, the initial number of family members, um, I'll just highlight there, 1,500 within all of the databases. Now, many of those were not either reachable, um, not reachable by phone, and or had declined. And ultimately, 338 agreed to research contact, and um, 265 interviews were performed. I'd like to move to our, our first paper that we, was published out of this study. As you can imagine, with that many interviews, it's a large, large volume of data that we've had. So we've had to make decisions on which parts to focus on first as we're moving through and, uh, and disseminating what we've learned from family members. So I'd like to really focus um, uh, a, a big portion of this talk on this publication on family recommendations to improve of the organ donation process. In this study, uh, our study analysis, we aggregated the data from across all of the provinces, and we specifically looked at family members' uh, experiences who had uh, consented to organ donation in that they'd be able to talk to us about that entire process. We um, had representation from all of the province provinces, and we, within the data set that we had coded, we specifically looked at one code, which was uh, directed recommendations from families and their suggestions for improving the process. And we pulled that directly from the data set as we had asked families specifically what their thoughts were. Um, but certainly many, many codes and still more data to come forthcoming from this, uh, from this study. Right. So here you can see the characteristics of the participating family members included in this analysis. There are 258 family members in total. Um, and uh, 
of those family members, there were more females. And in the relationship to the patient, you can see that here on the side at the top, parents, also um, those who were spouses or partners, uh, the child of uh, a loved one and, um, and others. And I'd also like to draw attention to the Alberta cohort here. You can see 21 family members uh, uh, shared their experiences with our team, and that's very much in line with other provinces and certainly a significant contribution to our understanding and um, of, of potential areas to improve. These are the patient characteristics. There were 252 patients, so there were a number of interviews that did include two parents. Um, so of the 252 patient cases that were included, you can see here that there were more males. Um, we certainly have uh, across various different age groups. And at the bottom, important to highlight that these are cases of both NDD and um, DCD organ donation uh, decisions and processes. Now I'd like to turn to the... the um, the, the results of the study and the various themes and sub-themes, and to discuss this in a bit more detail. Uh, the three major themes here being support person, connection to recipients, and follow-up. And as we go through these, I'm going to share some quotes from family members to really highlight uh, the messages that we were hearing in the data. The theme of support is certainly um, an incredibly important one. And again, just highlighting across this that there is certainly much gratitude from family members for the support that they're receiving, but they did identify recommendations on how we can, um, we can certainly enhance the, the, the family-centered care that we're providing. Within support, the shared experience part um, came up and in particular family members expressed wanting to have access to another individual who's had a lived similar experience available, whether in hospital or out of hospital, and um, to be able to connect with who may be accessible through a virtual donor network or otherwise. And they themselves also suggested that they, in, in, in a number of cases, would want to be that person to help other family members. Furthermore, having some way to be able to share resources that they have found helpful with others, such as online materials, books, information, organizations, and to be able to learn from what um, other family members in similar situations had found helpful. I'd like to share a quote here from a family member in this, um, in this sub theme. And here she said, Maybe a mom that went through the same thing I did to talk to and tell me what's coming next and what to expect, because there's a lot to take in. It's like, okay, I'm losing my son. Now you want his organs. I had time to soak that all in, but it would just be nice to have someone to sit with you and to talk to you. Just mom on mom, not a coordinator, not a doctor, not a nurse. I just don't think there's enough of that kind of support of that nature. Furthermore, in the court theme, uh, a couple of other sub-themes I wanted to talk about are regarding specific moments and critical transitions. Within specific moments, family members identified um, moments where uh, enhancing the clarity of information that's being provided by healthcare professionals by using multimodal techniques, so not just relying on a verbal communication in a single family meeting, but written information, uh, diagrams, pictures, and providing more support following difficult decisions specifically, such as decisions around the withdrawal of life support and decisions around organ donation. Around critical transitions, there's a number of spaces where we heard repeatedly from family members that there's moments that we can certainly enhance support and be there for them. And I'd like to talk about two of those moments with a couple of quotes. In this quote, um, a father shares of the moment when the body is being taken to the operating room and the importance of enhanced support during that time. And he said, 
I know my wife said the only thing that she wished would have been differently was when they took him, our baby boy, in. And then we were left alone outside the surgical room and never felt so empty and alone. And the interviewer asked, there was no one? You were completely alone in the hall? And he said, no one. It was just me and my wife in the hallway outside the door. And she said, so what did you do? And he replied, we walked back to the ICU and gathered up our things and left. And in different ways and in different moments, we did hear from family members that when the body is being taken to the operating room, that that there are um, there's a need for us to enhance the support at that time. The second transition that I wanted to talk about and share is when the hope uh, for donation is there and it does not occur, in particular in, um, in, in DCD cases, and the need for more presence and support when transitioning from the hope of donation uh, back to the ICU or back to a moment of knowing that that's not going to occur. Here this family member described when they extubated, the whole team was sitting outside. I kept looking at the clock. I cried. I kept saying, oh, please, God, you take him and let his organs help somebody if I'm going to lose him. And then I go, what the heck am I doing? I don't want to lose him. So it was back and forth, and it was all in my head, and I was sitting there trying to maintain calm in that room. Anyway, when it was over and they couldn't take his organs, I felt like I'd failed the world. I felt guilt. I felt like we failed somebody somewhere, many somebodies. The transplant team came in and said we can't take his organs. Then they backed out, and I never saw anybody for three hours. We were alone in there. And this is, again, a, a, a theme that we heard from family members in that moment of needing more support and also hearing from family members those additional feelings of loss and grief um, when the hope of donation is no longer po possible. Moving on to the second theme, um, uh, it really moves into the connection to recipients and different levels and layers to having connection to the recipients for those who are able to donate. And for some, having an awareness of the recipient status was described as really the need and, um, and having access to routine offered updates about the status of the transplanted organs and the recipients. Also ensuring that the provision of the information is easily accessible, uh, identifying challenges to trying to find out what happened for family members. Here, um, uh, shared with us in this quote, she said, I need to know as her mother. Yes, she donated her heart and we transplanted and that person is still living and is doing very well. Yes, somebody got a kidney, somebody else got a kidney, somebody got a double lung transplant because of your daughter. And you know what? They're living an active life. I need to know that. I need to know it's my right. I just think it would be nice if you could let me know if those organs were successful. For others, they went on to also talk about um, the importance to them for mutual connection and when both parties are mutually agreeable to have those opportunities to be able to contact and connect with the recipient. And along that line, um, suggesting removing mandatory wait times for this connection and removing barriers um, that were described to making these connections when agreed upon. And then in a few cases, um, and, and a number of cases, family members also discussed wanting facilitated meetings and actually directly meeting with the donor family and recipients. Along that mutual connection and the different ways of connecting, this is from a family member who shared with us. Um, he said, I had harassed them to please let me get into contact with them, the recipients, and I had to wait a year. I found that was too long. I had to wait a year to be able to correspond with my son's recipients, which I did. I got a response from two of them. My only issue with this procedure is that we are anonymous. I'm addressing somebody who has my son's organs and I don't know their name. It's like I'm dealing with an entity. So again, trying to make that human connection in these cases and the importance that that can have on their, um, on their, their healing and bereavement. 
I would also like to just highlight again, of course, these interviews were all with family members and we uh, did not interview recipients about their perspectives on this. The third theme from family members um, on their recommendations was regarding follow up. And again, certainly gratitude expressed for the follow up that they're receiving, but the hope and the need and want for more follow up in a number of different ways. The first two sub themes here uh, I'd like to share is around the organ recovery update. So regarding this is specifically on that donation surgery and knowing the outcome of the surgery, coupled with knowing what organs were recovered and when applicable, why certain organs were not recovered and not knowing this information can really leave a, an open wound and challenge in, in individuals bereavement. The second part here is on early mental health checks and having access to a mental health worker shortly after um, and, and we certainly heard from family members that there are substantial difficulties in accessing these services. Here on the organ recovery update, a family member shared, he, the transplant surgeon, called us and told us everything. He explained what organs they could use and what they couldn't use and told us where they went. And that was fine. I needed that information. On mental health checks, here, a different family member shared, when you go through a trauma, people are shoving cards at you from all over the place. I would have two, three cards in my pocket, but when you actually go to physically look for help, it's months away. So certainly big challenges in trying to access the services that they need. Furthermore, in follow-up, uh, family members shared wanting to have increased opportunities from um, other groups, whether the ODO, hospital, or another organization working with bereaved individuals, both in the immediate and in the long term. I think our study was also unique because we enrolled family members up to three years and really heard from family members of that need for a longitudinal um, engagement and opportunities to connect. They also shared wanting different modalities um, that are easy accessible, that family members can access at their own time and their own pace, um, recognizing that uh, everyone has individual needs and to try to tailor those follow-ups, not only for the main contact person, but the broader family, including siblings, pediatric cases, and accessing the type of follow-up and supports for them. The final part here uh, noted continuing to invite family members to donor ceremonies so that they can choose to attend when they're ready. A uh, family member here shared with us, I did receive two invitations to go to the donor ceremony. I was invited twice. I just wasn't ready to go. I do want to go, but I just wasn't ready. I'd like to move, I just wanted to put up this slide. There's a lot of information here and that part there sums up um, kind of some highlights on the recommendations from family members paper. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of data within this that we're still working through and compiling and, um, and disseminating in various ways. And we have information that can certainly help us with um, understanding family member experiences and, um, and, and enhancing family-centered care across numerous different areas. Draw attention to two here, um, death determination, and I'll move into that into the next section because we have had a chance to now analyze that data in more detail. And withdrawal of life-sustaining measures in cases of DCD, we have a draft manuscript on that that we're hoping will be under review soon, so these things will be um, uh, uh, coming forward. I wanted to take some time to also talk about uh, death determination by neurologic criteria and what family members understand and what we've learned from our study. Uh, we had the opportunity to look at this data as part of the DDD study, which is uh, death definition and determination with a national clinical practice guideline. Uh, there will be a special uh, issue of uh, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia that's going to be released, I think, within the next two weeks with a brain-based definition of death, along with uh, clinical practice guidelines on determination of death in both neurologic and um, 
uh, circulatory cases. And along that will be information um, and a publication on ways that we can help family members specifically in cases of neurologic criteria. Now, as I go through this, I will probably say brain death, um, which is not technical, but, but I do that because that's the way that family members um, speak to us about uh, their understanding as they went through their interviews. What we really heard from family members as we looked at this data, that understanding and acceptance of a uh, determination of brain death isn't really a moment in time, but more of a journey and a process. And there's things that we do that can help family members um, along that, that process. And also that this is very individualized and that the needs of family members within the same family system or in different situations uh, is different. So having um, access to different opportunities to try to help people. We have family generated recommendations that we've placed in a table that will be within the paper and I won't have time to go through everything here but really wanted to highlight some of the, the, the key things that we were hearing from family members that, um, that we can continue to do or that we can enhance when we're not doing it to work to help them during this really difficult and devastating time in the hospital. The first I'd like to talk about is state of mind and I think in all of our studies uh, with family members, we certainly hear time and time again of how challenging it can be to process information during a time of intense grief, exhaustion. Often things are happening very quickly. And um, I think we need to really continue to remind ourselves and recognize this because it, it, it helps us in thinking of the ways that we can try to help communicate and giving time and space for family members as they need it. Here, one family member shared with us I went in the state where I was thinking I wasn't hearing things right. Under the theme of communication, there's a lot here. And I think one of the key pieces is having um, access to spending time with family members, frequency of communication when we need to repeat and sit down over multiple meetings, and using multimodal communication. So not only relying on that conversation, but having things written down. Um, here a family member shared, nothing was written down. I was told verbally, but I don't remember. Um, so it can be a real challenge and opportunities where family members shared that looking at images or pictures or having things written down uh, would help them to process that information over time. The other part that is really important to recognize is that brain death or having being told that a loved one um, has been or, um, or may be declared brain dead can be described as counterintuitive and the challenge of, uh, uh, of this information being presented that can seem implausible when you're getting counter uh, information, their chest is moving as though they're breathing, their skin feels warm. Here a family member shared your heart and your mind are playing tricks on you. It's still not an easy thing to process. Uh, so giving that time and space and information to be able to work through processing uh, uh, this information. A key moment in uh, the journey uh, for many family members is the uh, DNC clinical assessment. And we heard from family members along a spectrum of preparedness. We did hear from family members who didn't feel prepared for the clinical assessment or that this was gonna happen. And then only hearing after that they had, their loved one had been declared dead uh, as a family member here shared. We didn't realize that they would have called her time of death without talking to us first. It was shocking. We certainly also heard from mothers who felt prepared, had sat down, they knew that the assessment was happening and it was helpful for them to know of that before, um, before the assessment was performed. The other part when coming to the clinical assessment is for those who were at the assessment and witnessed that, they shared with us how important that moment was for acceptance and how important for many it was to be there when the assessment was done with their loved one. Here a family member shared, 
I was there and they took him off the respirator. And if he breathed on his own, then he, there would be brain function. And if he didn't, so then I knew for sure. So I think it's another opportunity for us to look at, um, at, at family members being present during the assessment. The last part I just wanted to talk about within this data and um, share is on the time of death and um, and 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 things that we heard from family members regarding this. And the time of death, the actual time of death, can be confusing and can also be tied to different emotions um, that aren't necessarily explored or talked about in hospital. Uh, for example, feeling guilty if um, if they weren't there at the time that they had died, as shared here by one family member who said, I wasn't in the room at the time they issued that the death certificate, and I struggled with that. This idea of him passing without me by my side is really difficult. Here, I'll just place up um, a slide with um, with a, a, a link here at the bottom for the Canadian Clinical Guide to Organ Donation. There's multiple different modules that are now available um, from this work on a national uh, uh, level to uh, enhance education. It was developed specifically for critical care fellows, but certainly um, has information that I think can help across a lot of different healthcare professionals uh, groups. The um, family member data has been used to develop a specific communication module, which is currently in the final stages of production. So uh, we're expecting this to be placed up on the website, hopefully quite soon. Uh, and then finally here, just wanted to kind of open up for future directions and some of the pieces that we're thinking about as a group and hoping to engage with many groups and uh, as we move forward, I think we're in a really important position to to work really together to try to look at the 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 practical ways that we can enhance family centered care for these patients in our ICUs and once they've left the ICUs um, and and are really proposing to start thinking about creation of a family centered toolkit and engagement and activities and creating resources and education uh, that can be used by the organ donation organizations, coordinators, healthcare professionals, shared with family members to help them during these different times. Um, on the left side here are some of the things that we're thinking moving forward, important to inform this work. Uh, certainly, we've worked with family members across this um, this project on, on the entire development of the research program and that input and has been invaluable and forming a family member advisory committee, I think is really critical here. Audio and stakeholder engagement, scoping reviews um, and mapping out these lessons learned and taking all of that into tool development and listed some things here that again as a group we're starting to think about with developing booklets, check booklets, checklists, bedside tools, um, different ways to uh, have communication tools with individualized areas for information that can be provided to family members, websites, online resources. Um, educational materials. Uh, I think it would be important to look at family satisfaction tools that can be done. Interviews can be very arduous and we may um, want to work together to develop survey tools uh, that can be used in a more ongoing way to get information from family members. Um, so kind of thinking about some of those, those, those next steps coming from this work. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Really appreciate you guys being here and um, would look forward to any of your thoughts or questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sardi. Um, I, I, I uh, as we were talking before uh, this session, um, many of the findings that you were presenting does resonate with what we were hearing two weeks ago from a donor uh, family member and that need for a personalized approach at the at the moment that you're talking through donation options and all those kinds of things. And I think your toolkit is uh, a fantastic set of things that you can draw on. Um, the one thing that I was curious about was that uh, that idea of someone in the moment uh, who had been in their shoes, uh, a, a donor navigator, a donor 
advocate who you could phone, text, whatever it is. How practical might that be? Um, yeah, you know, at three o'clock in the morning or, or things like that for donor programs across the country to look at. Has there been any conversations there? Yeah, such a great question. So what I presented was really the recommendations from family members, the practical side of this and the implications of that are really important to look at. And sometimes also putting something in place, um, we may think that that could be helpful, but maybe it's not going to be helpful. So I think that there's some really big questions to looking at how we do that. Um, we've had some early kind of discussions with different groups around this and starting to look at other organizations that have peer-to-peer -peer support groups. It doesn't, and we haven't looked at all of that. So I think it's really important to do some more groundwork now that we've heard from family members that this is important. We do know that in some groups, um, for example, with pancreatic cancer, peer-to-peer your support groups can be helpful um, uh, and, and how to implement that and evaluate that in an ongoing way is still, I think, a really big question. I can see it being more feasible in the after hospital experience where some of this could be facilitated. Um, my own opinions is that I, I think it could be really challenging, especially for moments where this is happening really quickly. Sometimes things are happening within a matter of, uh, you know, an, a, a number of days and otherwise. So I think kind of starting with something and then building from it, which is why on that first slide there, our thoughts were, um, and it's all evolving, but our thoughts were to start on working on communication tools and booklets and resources, and then build up to being able to connect some of these peer peer supports, which I think could be super valuable. And to hear from people like, We've, we've heard from family members that they feel alone and some of the things that they're experiencing, many family members are experiencing the, the loss of donation and when that can't happen, when you're really hoping for that, it can be very devastating for a family member to process that. And um, so trying to have more supports in place um, to what we already, to what we already have and building on that. Well, wow, that's great. Um, I just encourage everybody, uh, you can share your camera if you have a question, put it into the chat, use the hand up function. We do have one question uh, from one of our, our uh, amazing patient partners, Donna, uh, and she's asking if the campus.blood.ca courses uh, might be available for patient family and donor families as well, uh, or perhaps an alternate course in plain language and wh whether that would be helpful. Oh, Donna, that's such a great question. And um, I honestly don't have the answer. That's the first time that I was asked that. Um, I, I believe that it will be open, um, not specifically just to healthcare professionals, but I'll have to look into that. And I think your suggestion for something to be tailored into plain language is really, really valuable. And uh, just made a note of that as well, because as we start to move forward on these packages or, or toolkits and having something like that, that could be easily accessed for those who want to do it. And not everyone's going to want to, but I'd really like to see varied resources for family members. Thank you. It's a great comment. Everyone, I was, I was just going to say, everyone knows um, medical terminology and doctors speak um, you can get lost in it if it's not your disease or your experience. But when you're in the time of trauma or grief or making these decisions, it's the last thing that you your brain needs to work through. Yeah. So perhaps yeah. even even those plain language course, if you could translate it to plain language, this might be a starting point to maybe train some of those support peer to peer support people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. E even um, if it was in the next six to eight hours after because I yeah. mean it, it's like shell shock right we all know yeah yeah uh, um I, I just think your findings are very significant and what we need here in Alberta um I was part of a the regional breakout discussion in the donation conference last year and this is where the conversation stopped because there was seemed to be a disconnect from getting asking people to donate and getting consent to bring them to Edmonton. Because sometimes when people learned they had to leave their community, it was a no. Mm -hmm. And then when people got to Edmonton, they didn't know where to go for resources. So there was 
this is a very needed piece of research that you're doing. I'm really excited to see everything. And I can't wait to see all the articles published. I'm assuming there's going to be four or five published. We're working on it. Yeah, there's a number forthcoming. I, I really appreciate the comments. It it, it means so much. Um, uh, it means so much. Uh, and we are all within our group really passionate about this work and um, honoring the families voices who came forward with us and not just hearing from it and putting out the recommendations, but moving forward with ways to try to help people. And I think as healthcare providers, it's, I did many of these in for, interviews as well it's really hard to sometimes hear moments where people felt alone and we weren't where, there for them and it doesn't take away from all of the other ways that we've supported but I think these recommendations are really important to try to put processes in place so that those spaces where we've heard that we can do more and some of those things are some of those things are frankly a bit easier you know having someone dedicated right when the body's going to the OR and trying to figure out who that person is and it's going to be different in different settings so that may be easier to implement some of the other parts are going to be harder and and harder for different organizations and which is why i've tried to our group's really trying to move it to a national level so you know if there's resources that are being developed in alberta and we can work together on that that really may help new brunswick where it's a smaller program and they don't have necessarily access so i would just love to see a really strong continued national engagement on this so that we can build these things together great great questions donna uh, Linda, do you want to ask your question or, or you want me to just read it? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you so much for such a terrific presentation. Shuts, I don't mean the solid information, with this solid information base. Um, some thoughts about where limited resources could be best placed first. And I know each province, each organization will have their own thoughts about that as well. But um, to add to that is, you know, we talk about building a culture of donation, but it, it's about trust in the system. And when we have those stories that you've relayed today, I mean, it brings tears to your eyes that people were in those situations. We were to be a caring profession and help the donor families heal as well as the recipient who's going on to another life. And, um, you know, it, it, individual families telling those stories with that negative reflection on it will of course directly or indirectly impact future consent rates as well so um how do we change the direction of the train so again where best to put the resources initially if there's only limited resources where do you have some thoughts about where that could initially be kick-started because there's so many recommendations yeah yeah there's there's certainly a lot that's there um Kind of a hard question, I think, to answer. And um, I think we're looking at how to prioritize different pieces and different in different ways. But I think um I think big pieces, if I'm kind of put on the spot for what what I think are big takeaways, is um right. the preparation for family members is huge. And my my own practice has changed a lot in the way that I look after these patients as well. But that actual the preparation of what expectations are around donation. Um, you know, trying to understand that donation may or may not happen, trying to set up the resources that they may have for after, whether it's a, you know, that preparation for everything that we do, if it's someone who I think has progressed to brain death, not telling a family member right after that, but, but, but working on spaces where they, they know that's potentially coming so that, um, you know, that, that whole piece isn't coming as big shocks and feeling unsupported. Uh, I know in our group, I've presented this work and uh, the amount of support after donation, we've really tried to enhance that within our own hospital. So we always have someone dedicated to the family member after the body's taken away or when donation doesn't happen and who that is, is different. And I think it's hard because our, our systems are changing so much right now because of the pandemic and resource limitations and so we have it on a kind of checklist and ideally we want that to be someone who's more senior I was interviewed about this and it was suggested maybe a medical student or a resident but these are really deep and hard feelings so to be able to sit with a family member and after and say you know some people tell me that they feel lost right now or what are you feeling is that something that you're feeling and giving a space to just talk about it I think takes a lot of expertise and I think we're all still learning and developing our expertise so um, the key pieces I think in hospital are that preparation and then the support following and just those those check-ins so that 
people don't feel alone and know we're here if they want to talk. Um, but it, it's hard. There's a lot of spaces to, to work on. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think some of the quotes and uh, hearing, you know, even just the whole topic of loneliness at that moment in time is tough. And I was I was curious, um, having gone through a surgery myself during the pandemic and not having family able to be with you and all those kinds of things. Um, how has the pandemic influenced it? Like, was, when was your data collection done in relation to the pandemic? And then also, was there a big pandemic um, influence on ability for additional family members to be around you? So you aren't standing all by yourself outside the OR doors or things like that. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. So all of this data is pre-pandemic. So before kind of the, it's all before um, the pandemic and things have changed things. So we don't have mm -hmm. that information. And I think the family member experience in every institute was variable and definitely changed through from not even being able to donate when you wanted to, because um, there was just um, no ability and there was too many questions to transitioning back to that and then trying to get family members present. But I think we've come out of that now, certainly in our hospital for quite some time, our family members are present in our ICU and present in um, organ donation and end of life care and, um, and, and, and engaged in many different ways. But I think even, even outside of the presence and having that presence, I know that we've seen big changes and you know, there's less social work um, availability. Our nurses are way more junior and we've lost a lot of our senior nurses within the group. And that's really hard because these cases also the frequency of them, um, depending on your institute may not be very frequent. So, um, and it's one of the things that inspired our work in the beginning, wanting to do this for critical care fellows, because really we've wanted to make sure our critical care fellows are well-trained, but how do you train them to look after the families with these very specific and different needs when they see, mm -hmm. you know, a handful of cases through their whole training? Um, so I think frequency of cases, the level of expertise in the group has really changed also um, following, following the pandemic. And that's another challenge. And, you know, even myself, like during different moments, I would, I would really like to be, you know, there to go back to that family and then sit down with them. But I know sitting down with them takes time and to do it well is going to take me away from things. And so trying to figure out my dedicated time when I'm running an ICU and I've got, you know, the emergency department and um, we're now overflowing and doubling up on patients, it, it becomes really hard. And I think, um, yeah, it's just a struggle within the system to make sure we have the right people, the right resources. And, and, uh, and I think we're being asked to do a lot more with less, which makes it hard too. Yeah, for and, sure. Well, and, a, and an interesting comment about junior, um, you know, losing your senior um, staff and, uh, and uh, the change in the culture, I'm sure as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just and I speak about kind of in the hospital, but um, I'm, I'm working with a group uh, that's leading uh, work with coordinators and burnout within coordinators too. This is emotionally very fatiguing and exhausting work. And the coordinators are doing a lot to support families. Um, families are sharing that they're they, they need more in different moments, but um, but how to be able to provide that while taking care of the staff who have many different responsibilities, I think we have to be cognizant of. We have a few more minutes before the top of the hour, but uh, are there any other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, Patricia. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, for, so much for a, a really excellent presentation and, and really important research. I was wondering, um, you were talking about the importance of a, a national approach to, to tool development and, and um, building the, the different sort of outputs to, to feed into education and, and so on. Is there the national framework in place to take that approach or is that something that, that needs to be developed? Another great question. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot to be developed within that. I suppose my kind of vision and dream would be to have a, a, a whole group of national engagement on um, family-centered care of potential organ donors and to have representation across these different groups across the different provinces uh, from 
the family centered care perspective of these family members, I don't think we're there. Um, the hope, my hope would be um, to continue to work with people. So we're, um, we're starting to have discussions with Canadian Blood Services and different groups like yourself um, and, uh, you know, BC and Nova Scotia. I met with the um, organ donation coordinators who came together in a national education day. And I think there's a lot of interest. We need to kind of take that and move it to action. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm not aware of any group that's really brought it to that that level unless others are um, but I think that there's a lot of momentum and I think it's incredible when I kind of talk about these things and people are really passionate about looking after these family members and um, I think we just need to be able to have a venue where we can kind of hear from you know like in BC where we, we changed this and it really worked and this was fairly straightforward or you know in Alberta we had made these changes after we had heard from some family members already and and this is how we implemented it and this is what helped or how we could do things different and so I think having that developing that structure is going to take some time but we'll just um, create the basis for uh, I think an amazing future body of work to help fa support family members it's a great question mm -hmm. any other questions from the audience Otherwise, we will let Dr. Sardi go back to her clinical round. I got her out of office this morning when I oh, tried to email her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> head coverage, um, for you, but back to work. It's a, it's a great strategy. Houston, you're out of office. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sardi, and I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks for having me. Take care. Okay. Bye now. <laughs>